What's going on, everybody? It's Blake Bowman here, and welcome to the first official episode of the Blake Bowman Podcast. Today, I have my good friend, Dr. Ryan DeBell on, and in today's podcast, we're talking about a lot of different things, ranging from cupping, how he uses cupping in his practice, um, hip variances that are going to change the way you squat, and the drawbacks and advantages to chiropractic care. Um, That's pretty much it. I hope you enjoy it. Ryan DeBell, thanks for coming on, man. It's been a while since we've uh, last chatted on here. Yeah, thanks for having me on here again. No problem, man. Um, all right, so I want to—I want you to quickly kind of introduce yourself. Why don't you tell everybody what you're most uh, known for in the fitness industry, for those of you that don't know who you are? Sure, I think that the, the thing that I'm probably most known for um, is my article, The Best Kept Secret, Why People Have to Squat Differently. And it's an article showing hip anatomical variations and a brief description of how those variations can make people have to squat a different way. Um, so that's what I'm most known for. And then a little bit about my background is I'm a chiropractor by trade. So my doctor is in chiropractic. I have a master's degree in sport and exercise science. I run the website, themovementfix.com, and I teach workshops and blog and, uh, treat people in person and all that good stuff. Awesome, man. Yeah. So there you go, everybody. Make sure to check Ryan out at uh, The Movement Fix. He's all over social media and the internet. Just type in The Movement Fix and you'll be able to find him. Um, what I, w- I just basically today, Ryan, I have a couple questions in regards to uh, certain topics um, that I want to ask you about. And I also want you to kind of explain some of the things that I've seen you doing with your patients and the people that you work with that I'm not really familiar with. And I'm just kind of curious as to, uh, you know, why you're using those modalities and, you know, what they're for. Um, But the first thing that I wanted to talk to you about was um, unilateral hip variances. Okay, so this is kind of a complex subject for those of you that don't know. But um, basically, (laughs) people can be born with congenital, meaning something that they're born with, variances in their hips that are going to dictate the way their hips move. And it's also going to dictate the squat stance that they're going to take. It's going to dictate what's considered optimal for that person. Okay. Um, Ryan has videos on this. What's what's your video called, Ryan, on that? Um, The one where I analyze the hip motion. Yeah. And you kind of break it down. Yeah, so that's one of my weekly um, videos. I think it's uh, squat, quick squat assessment. Yeah. Or quick hip assessment for squatting, something like that. I think that is what you titled it. Yeah, so if you guys go yep. over to Ryan's YouTube channel, which is uh, The Movement Fix, and search for that video, you'll be able to find it. I've also made a video on this. It's called How to Find Your Optimal Squat Stance, I believe. So if you're confused as to what we're talking about, pause this and go over there and check that out. Um, but Ryan, it makes, you know, I don't understand this as well as you do, but um, what, so when somebody has a unilateral, you know, variance, meaning that only one side is affected with either like retroversions in normal alignment or, or antiverted, what does, well, how do you work around that? Because it makes sense if you have, if you have the same imbalance by bila- or same variance bilaterally, but what do you do if you only have it on one side and you're trying to figure out your squat stance? Sure. So basically what we're saying is that the the person's maximal hip flexion or the depth of getting into a squat is going to be different on one side versus the other is what we're basically talking about, right? Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, what's interesting to think about, so think about this. I think it's easier to think about it in the shoulder because I think you see it more uh, clearly. So let's talk about it in the shoulder to, so we can relate it back to the hip. If you think about someone who plays baseball and you think about someone who say, let's, let's say they're a pitcher and they start pitching when they're, uh, young, they're going to develop. And you know, this is not like an unknown thing. They're going to develop a a certain range of motion in their shoulder on their throwing arm. That's very different than their non-throwing arm. Mm -hmm. Okay. They have a ton of external rotation and they usually have limited internal rotation. I think Mike Reinald talks about this all the time. And okay. So say that person does that when they're growing up, when they're young and then they're older. And now what they're going to do is go lift a barbell overhead. Well, their shoulders move completely differently. Yes. And so you attach them to a a fixed object like a barbell, right? So they have to basically do the same thing if you're going to do a symmetrical lift like any sort of barbell movement really is for the arms. 
you know, and that may not be the best option for that person because the barbell is fixed and you may have to use dumbbells or kettlebells instead so the shoulders can do what they need to do. Mm -hmm. If you're thinking about it in terms of uh, squatting and how you get around it, my question would be, okay, <clears throat> so say for example, one, say the person is a, did some sort of sport that made their hips a little bit different through development, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, so what I would do is figure out what their hip flexion kind of depth is. You know, do they have better hip flexion with more or less internal or external rotation or abduction or adduction? So basically, which where is their knee and where is it track? And you know, I don't see a problem if, if someone has a big difference side to side. The mm -hmm. first thing you have to ask yourself is, does it make squatting impossible? Yeah. Because if, if someone has like a crazy difference and, and you know, maybe someone fractured um, their humor or their, their femur, or their pelvis when they were younger and now they have a weird or, or difficult hip motion, you know, they might only be able to squat to a certain depth or they may have to only do lunging or they may only have to do something like that. But if somebody has a slight variation in, in terms of, hey, their right foot has to turn out just a little bit more than the left to get full depth of squatting, you have to ask yourself the question, if I try to make that perfectly symmetrical mm -hmm. and then they compensate somewhere else. Yeah. So say you're like, oh, no, your feet have to be the same degree turned out. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you have perfectly symmetrical hips, that, yes. But if they're asymmetrical and then you do that and, they, and the feet are pointed in the same direction so that they look side to side, so we scratch the itch that we have in our coaching brain that everything has to be perfectly symmetrical, then and, and, and in doing so, their knee drops in or their knee flops way out or it causes their low back to round at, you know, at the bottom of a weighted squat. Yeah. I would say that having one leg turned out a little bit, as long as the knee tracks properly and you don't get compensation in the low back, I don't see that as an issue. Is that ideal? Hey, you know what? Not everybody's perfectly symmetrical. Mm. And so they may have to have a little bit of a difference in the hip, but the hip is a ball and socket joint. And so the hip can accommodate multiple positions better than the spine can, especially under load. And so long as you're not impinging at the hip, I don't see why that would be an issue to have a little bit of variation in the stance. Now, that doesn't mean everyone should go out there and have sloppy looking squats. Now, that's not what we're saying. <laughs> Right, because <laughs> invariable, someone will listen to this and be like, "Oh, it doesn't matter. Just have all your feet, you know, different or whatever." Yeah, that's not what we're saying. I mean, but if, but if you can't get into the bottom of a squat symmetrical because you have a hip difference in terms of structure, which you'd have to determine, um, I would go for the non-compensated knee and the non-compensated low back with a little bit of difference in the hip position. I'm okay with that. I see. Yeah. So that's what I was thinking would be the solution, but it just seemed weird to like allow that asymmetry to kind of like it, that would just look so funky like letting somebody squat that way right yeah and i mean but that's i mean i think the variation that we're talking about is probably not that big for most people mm -hmm. however if someone has such a crazy variation that having their hip out there i mean the the hips are these like ball bearing joints that are attached to the cylinder that's the spot you know the trunk uh -huh. And so, you know, if you can move the hips well and the, and the cylinder doesn't get twisted or bent. Yeah. It's just, I don't think it's, you know, such a big issue. But of course, I'm not going to have people like, it's the Wild West and people are <laughs> doing these crazy one leg's pointed forward, uh, the other leg's pointed yeah. straight out to the side. And be I like, think oh, that's okay, like what yeah, people I imagine. I that guy on the internet. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, and that's not what I, you know, but if someone has to toe out a couple degrees uh -huh. and, and now they can get in depth. But the question you have to ask is, first of all, if someone has that much of a hip variation, is doing a symmetrical is is doing a squat or symmetrical lift i mean do they is that the best thing for them yeah is that even beneficial or is that right what because be because what, what if that person could lunging what if they could do jumping drills what if, what if there's other strength training activities that they can do that don't load them in a way that may not be so good yeah. just like that baseball player mm -hmm. if they have such a symmetry in their shoulders you know, they, a barbell may not be the best thing to use for them overhead lifting, and they may need something like dumbbells. And if you think about using dumbbells and kettlebells overhead is basically the same thing as squatting with an asymmetrical stance, isn't it? Yes. Very fascinating. All right, well, there's your answer, people. Anybody that was wondering about the unilateral hip variances. Um, that kind of like brings me to another question, Ryan. And I know this is kind of complicated, but it's something that I 
have not made a lot of videos on myself, um, and that is anterior hip pain, okay, pain in the front of the hip. Obviously, this can be caused by a lot of different, you know, dysfunctions. Um, I recently made a, a video about anterior femoral glide syndrome and how that can cause impingement and lead to pain. Um, but in general, in your opinion, what's your general protocol when somebody comes in with hip pain, frontal hip pain? So anterior hip pain, I mean, I guess, when are they experiencing it? Are they experiencing it with the, say it's the right leg. Is it mm -hmm. when the right leg is back or is it when in the depths of a squat? Yeah. Or so, is it with twisting the hip? I mean, because those are all different. Mm -hmm. um, what about just chronic pain with, when the hips are extended, when somebody's standing upright and when they're flexed, just like kind of pain in the hips at the bottom of the squat, standing just kind of like a generalized pain in the front of the hip always, regardless of hip position. What do you normally assume is the culprit? Well, I can't make that assumption. I mean, because the way I see it typically is that someone have, they'll have no hip pain standing, and then if they go into the bottom of a squat, they'll get pinching. Mm -hmm. So I see that a lot uh, in the front of the hip. Yeah. Or they'll have pain with the leg backwards, or they'll have just kind of an achiness, but the forward and the backwards will feel will won't really make a big difference. Right. And so each one of those okay. things, it would it would be. It. You see what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, yeah. Yeah. You're talking about like a. Um, so yeah. pick one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So like full hip flexion at the bottom of the squat, somebody okay. feels a pinchy sensation. That is the most common there. one. Mm -hmm. That's the most common one. Yeah. So a lot of people will feel pinchy in the anterior hip at the bottom of the squat, right? And um, typically what I have to do is I have to scour through their hip. So I'm taking their hip and I'm moving it around and I'm finding, you know, mechanically, can I recreate that pain or not? There's a lot of structures in the front of the hip. There's the tendons of the hip flexors. You have the femoral nerve, artery, and vein. You have multiple muscle attachments. Um, there's lymphatic stuff, you know, and, and mm -hmm. so, um, and of course there's all the connective tissue. And then you have, you know, the joint, you have the labrum, you have the capsule, you have many tissues in the front of the hip Yes. Um, as well. So, um, and so anyways, what I'll do mechanically though is I'll, is I'll check a couple of things. I'll check their hip flexion mm -hmm. and, and, and just get a baseline sense of what their pain is like. I'll check hip flexion with certain degrees of internal and external rotation, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, typically what I find with this person is when I flex and internally rotate them in their hip, um, it really recreates the symptom. That's yes. very common. It's not the, you know, it's not always the case, but it's very common. Um, and so what I have to look at is I have to think about, is it just a mechanical impingement that they've become sensitive to, which mm -hmm. is very often the case. So I have to watch them squat. I have to watch them move. I have to see how they use their body. A lot of these people, when they squat, they may be squatting too narrow. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're squatting too wide. If they are internally rotating their hip when they squat, that's like a mechanically impinged position and, and they may have become sensitive to that. And so I'll check different and, and see if I can put them in different squatting positions. I'll see if I turn their feet out, does that help? If I make them push their knees out farther, if I bring their feet in, and, and I'll try to see if I can find clearance. So that's kind of one of the first things that I'm thinking about and looking at. Like clearing up the pinching sensation at the bottom of the squat, that's clearance, right. like any right. position I, that alleviates yeah. that. Exactly. Can I find a way for them to squat without pain? Mm -hmm. That's because that'll tell me that it, you know, it's really changeable, you know, it's, it's, it, and it may just be how they're doing it. And is that what you would recommend people do if they were not working with you kind of working on their own to try to get to the bottom of the pinchiness and the, at the bottom of their squat, just kind of play around with different positions to, to, to leave the pinchiness right and yeah but, well i mean that's one thing you can do um of course i think when people have chronic pain for a long time and they have this stuff they should get it looked at and examined but if someone wants Definitely. to attempt to do it on their own then um yeah you know trying different squatting positions trying different widths can you find a range of motion in a squat that you can do it without pain you know a lot of times people just they they it hurts to squat the way they squat it doesn't hurt to squat it hurts to squat the way they squat Yes. And so if I can change that. Another thing that I have to think about is if, if someone has um, a ton of low back extension or if they have a uh, anteriorly tilted pelvis, that'll tilt the acetabulum of the hip downwards and potentially they can run into the roof of the hip socket sooner. Mm. And so they have an issue with overextended lumbar spine in the bottom of a squat, which basically flexes the hip before they even actually flex the hip. And then they'll pinch. So I have to check a lot of times to see if stabilizing 
or pelvis and lumbar spine corrects the problem. So what I could do, for example, is have them lay on their back on the table and do like a little mini crunch and then recheck their hip flexion and see if that makes it go away or not. That's another possibility. Um, Usually what this person has to do is a combination of multiple things. (laughs) Because usually this person has been, they keep letting it stay aggravated. Yes. And they need to let the sensitivity die down. Yeah. And then they They're need to work They're just constantly on the reinducing like acute inflammation, right? Well, yeah. I mean, okay. So you, you cut your finger and it, here's what's always interesting. You cut your finger, you have a paper cut and now is that, that is the biggest water bottle. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty big. That's pretty big. It's it such a small mouthed water bottle for the size yes. of the yes. water bottle. Anyway. So if you're listening to this on iTunes. Yeah. If you're listening uh, to this, you don't you even You better know get to the video about. so you can see the size of this water bottle. Um, so usually this person okay so imagine that you cut your finger and there's a cut and it's healing and there's a scab you know like, oh i gotta recheck it i gotta recheck it and then you're just picking at the scab oh i gotta roll it like if you had a cut why would you roll out on a cut you yes. would just interrupt the healing process mm-hmm. and a lot of times people just don't let things get better yeah you know i was just at Stuart mcgill's class this past weekend which was excellent mm-hmm. and he was talking about this book that he's releasing i think it gets released this week but um and in it he was talking about the concept of virtual surgery for people with low back pain and virtual surgery meaning you know maybe people get better from back surgery because they actually finally rest mm-hmm. and they don't bend their spine weird and they don't crank on things and he was like why don't people just pretend they got surgery and then actually act like they're recovering yeah. and so i think a lot of times you know it's like oh i've had this pain i've had this pain i've had this pain and then they never do anything about it they just and they never change what they're doing and mm-hmm. you know if, if you keep doing the same thing that led it to be painful in the first place and then you continue to do it and then like no known amount of stretching can undo yeah. you damaging or irritating something yeah i think that that's really good advice and despite how obvious it sounds it's rare in our industry you know it's like if if some sort of movement pattern that you have is causing this cycle of inflammation in your soft tissues and you're not stopping that. You're, you're not going to be able to foam roll or stretch it away. You know, it's you need to just stop the movement that's causing the tissue inflammation, or it's not going to get better if you don't do that, right? Right. So you know, things can get sensitive. Like an example, I tell patients and stuff all the time is like, okay, so there was this time when I was at a CrossFit gym and someone's kid was running and knocked uh, one of the rowers over. You know what I mean? Like a like a Concept Two rower. Uh huh. And like, so it was being stored vertically and it landed on my foot, like the, oh the, 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 yeah. And my, my, and like, I don't think it was broke. I never got it looked at, but, um, I don't think it was broken, but literally like it was just sensitive to the touch for like six months and then it just got better, uh-huh. you know? And like, it, it's not like stroking the top of my foot with my hand is damaging, but the tissue was sensitive. Yes. Um, and what I have to do is give that time to not be so sensitive. Yeah, I can't just like think I'm going to foam roll at the top of my foot. It's just sensitive. Mm-hmm. Yes, it just needs time to not be sensitive. <laughs> yeah, and people no. don't take they don't take time. Like they feel guilty if they don't do something. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, I can't tell you how many problems I've had personally, like pain or whatever, that just get better when you just stop obsessing over it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So that's always interesting. Hey, you got to let your body run through the stages of acute inflammation. You know, your body's going to send in cells there to remove dead debris. If you know about the stages of inflammation, it takes time. You can't, if you're just re, you know, traumatizing the tissues, it's never going to heal. You know, you need. Right, exactly. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, like I said, that's a uh, funny piece of advice that I think is totally obvious, but like not very commonly uh, given to people especially in our uh, in what we do with people um i kind of actually want to talk about just because i want to make sure we get this in we can come back to that but i'd like to talk about uh, cupping and okay. um, so ryan does this thing called cupping and you know i don't have any experience with this the only time i've seen cupping is in like chinese medicine um but karate kit yeah so what are you using cupping for ryan 
Sure. So I'm not like formally trained in cupping. I think of cupping as another way to do any sort of soft tissue treatment. Um, so basically with a, there's different kinds of cups. There's cups where they're glass and people light fire to create suction. Uh, there's cups that have pumps so you can pump the air out. So you'd put the, you'd put the uh, cup on the skin and then you'd pump the air out and create the skin would get like, yeah, you create a vacuum and the skin would get pumped into the cup. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but another type of cup and it's the cup that I primarily use is a, uh, it's like a silicone cup. So it's flexible so I can move it around. So what I'll do typically um, is if I need to work soft tissue on somebody for whatever reason I've justified to myself, um, I'll put some sort of emollient on the skin. So some sort of like lotion y oil type thing. Lube. Lube up the skin. <laughs> sure. And then, and then I'll put the cup on. And then I'll move the cup around. And I, may, and I may move the cup around on their skin while they're moving their arm. Or they, I may do it while they're moving or you know, rotating. For example, this guy had uh, earlier today had pain with rotating his trunk at a rib. And so um, after doing some stuff diagnosis-wise, I put the cup on there and had him rotate actively as I cupped into rotation around his rib, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. Um, so he's standing and, there without his shirt on. You got this cup on his skin. He's rotating his trunk and you're holding the cup statically or, or sliding no, I'm, it? I'm, I was gliding it while he was rotating, like in the opposite direction. I see. Um, but, you know, in my opinion, most soft tissue treatment is neurological in uh, the reason why it works. Mm. So I don't know. So it may just be that cupping is a different stimulus. And there's probably some people out there who do cupping who like hate me right now for like saying that's what I do. But yeah. uh, I don't cup like over acupressure points or anything like that. I cup, I, I do... I think of it like orthopedic cupping, like I cup in, with the intention of changing some sort of orthopedic thing. And anyway, so I consider most soft tissue treatment um, to be effective because of how you stimulate the nerve endings in either the connective tissue or in the muscle or in the skin, you know, those types of things. And so like say Graston or, or whatever metal scraping tool technique yeah. you want to use, you know, that that's a very different type of stimulation than cupping is because mm-hmm. there's tension with the cupping. There's, you know, uh, stretch more so than there is with um, Graston because you're like literally pulling the skin. And so um, that's how I use it. Yeah. And, you know, I think in the traditional kind of cupping world, it's to do acupressure points and maybe you can create space between layers if you do you think that's possible, that type of thing? You don't think uh, that's possible? Well, I mean, you're pulling the skin into the cup, so you, you have yeah. to be doing something. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? Are you can, you can you break up connective tissue? You know what's interesting? It's like scar tissue is some of the most robust connective tissue, right? Uh-huh. And if you, if you did cupping to like break up scar tissue, wouldn't you break up everything else that's less tough first? Yes, you would assume so. <laughs> So, you know, like, why would it just break up scar tissue? If you're doing that, I think you'd break up everything. Interesting. Yeah, I worked with a... <laughs> you ever a, thought about that? Yeah, no, I haven't. Um, <laughs> why, what is, maybe I'll make a, maybe I'll write an article. I've never, I've never really, like, talked about it this way externally, but um, it, it, is foam rolling specific to scar tissue? You know, it's not like the foam roller knows where mm-hmm. scar tissue is. It's very non-specific treatment. Yeah. So why do people think that what, you know, oh, the effect is on scar tissue. It's like, what? But you're pushing through everything else. Why is scar tissue the only thing affected by a foam roller? Come on. All right. So I want to hear you talk more about uh, your idea that most soft tissue manipulation is neurological. Sure. I mean, I don't think it's my idea. I think it's a lot of people's idea. But Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, you know, in the skin, I guess it depends where, but there's like, you know, thousands, maybe a thousand nerve endings per square centimeter of skin. There's a ton of nerve endings in the superficial fascia, you know, like, okay, when people have a very quick change in their range of motion, right? Like, okay. I, I, so this guy with the rib, right? Okay. I cut lightly for like a minute and then suddenly he has this huge range of motion improvement with less pain. Yeah. You know, I think it's very unrealistic to think that I broke anything up when it's non not painful, when it's very light and it's very quick period of time, it's much more likely that it's a reflex. So you stimulate the nerve endings, the sensory nerves in the skin and other connective tissue. It goes to the spinal cord in the brain and then it reflexively relaxes the muscle around it and you get an improved range of motion and then we misinterpret it and think that we broke something up, but it's actually because it was a reflex and it's a much more likely and logical explanation, mm-hmm. especially when, okay, somebody rolls something out and they get a huge increase in range of motion and then like 10 minutes later it's tight again. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. For sure. Well, why would scar tissue have reformed in exactly the same way ten minutes later? That's fascinating. <laughs> Do you think that it's possible that it could be a little bit of both happening? Well, if it was, if you broke up the scar tissue, it would be, it wouldn't reverse, would it? Yeah. I don't know why it would reverse. Like if there, say there's this huge chunk, because I think this is what people visualize. There's this huge chunk of like of like scar tissue, and it, it's, and I break it up, and then I have this huge range of motion, and then oh, the range of motion went away. Why would it? Why would scar tissue reform after you broke it up? and then limit you in exactly the same way that it was before when you didn't do anything. Yeah, no, that's, that's very That makes no sense. I mean, just logically, that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. However, what's more likely the X, and, and maybe there's some like change in the flexibility of connective tissue, you know, that's possible too, which still tells you that you're not breaking something up because the, the idea that you're like breaking this physical connection. Yeah. Why would a physical connection reform for no reason? Mm -hmm. And that and, instantaneously. Right. right. And so quickly and so effortlessly, especially when you do it really light. Um, anyways, and, and then the reason it comes back is because then you have output from your brain going and making the muscles contract again. So you have a, what looks like reformed scar tissue. So you shut down that neural drive temporarily and then you start moving around again. The neural drive just kicks back on, causes the same kind of tissue uh, dysfunction so you when before. you hear everybody say like oh it's a, you know it's not a, it's not a mobility problem it's a stability problem mm -hmm. right you hear this i'm sure everybody hears this yes well what that means is as soon as you put your body under load and stress again your brain outputs more tension to the muscles that it's been overusing and then it gets tight again mm -hmm. and so the whole idea of like like rolling out is one small piece of the puzzle to me yeah rolling out like opens a crack in the window and then I can maybe start taking advantage of it. Mm -hmm. So what do you do once you've shut down that neural drive with your, oh, I teach, I teach him how to move. Yeah. Teach him how to move in a different way. So you use example, that, you, that's like a window of opportunity for you, right? After you cup them. That's all it is. Yeah. I mean, and, and maybe, maybe what you can do, to, maybe there's like some weird reflex loop or um, something like that going on. And, and if you can, and if you can break up that loop, maybe it'll normalize on its own. You know, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that has never happened and I've never seen that, but for the most, most people, you know, I think of my job as teaching people how to use their body. You know, I don't think of my job as like a joint popper or yeah. a scar tissue breaker or anything like that. I think I, my job is to teach someone how to use their body and use it in a way that makes sense and how to not hurt themselves and how to get stronger and how to um, create muscle. You know, a lot of times I don't want people to loosen something up. I want someone to tighten something up. Yeah. I want them to make a connection from their brain to their body. Because if you don't know how to like use a muscle, like, you know, okay, so I like this example. I use this a lot. If I put my hands in mittens mm -hmm. for a year, okay, and then I take them out and then I try to do something, I have to like know how to bend my fingers again. You know how to say like, I should say it like this. Imagine you were born and your hands were in mittens, okay? So you never learned how to use them. All right. You're not going to like take your hands out and then be texting 100 words a minute on your iPhone. Yes. You have to know how to bend your thumb. You have to know how to bend your other fingers and hold things and create muscle tension and let things relax. And a lot of people just don't know how to let something relax or they don't know how to control a joint or they don't know how to create stiffness somewhere so that they can move somewhere else. They yeah. don't know how to transfer power from one joint to another joint. It's so much more complicated than just stretch it and hope yes you know all right so there you have it people that's what that's basically what foam rolling and stretching a lot a lot to you is, is a window of time to work on your movement and uh ryan would you recommend like intermittent tissue work in between like movement because of the the like re triggering of the muscle tone I like where you're going. Well, yeah. let me say this before, though, because some people are doing research or have done research saying that maybe you can improve recovery times by foam rolling. So I just want to make sure that I give credit to that sort of line of thought. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I so what I teach in my workshop, I teach a general principled flow of how to like work on something. So say we're working on pulling off the ground, say we're working on deadlifting or swings or something, right? And you have a area of your body that is 
there's too much neural drive or too much tone in those muscles to allow you to do it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe I use rolling between sets as to decrease the tone in one area and then I'll do other drills to increase the tone or increase the uh, activation, I guess you could say, or the ability to use another area so that you can then integrate it into your actual set. So it actually makes sense. You know, it's funny people do like stretching and rolling and then they never actually connect it to the thing that they wanted it for in the first place. Yeah. Like they'll stretch out their ankles to squat better, but they never actually do something for their ankles and then actually squat. You mean like a neuromuscular activation in the, or they do something right? Like, okay, the biggest limitation of my squat is my ankles, right? Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure a lot of people think that. And so they stretch their calves or whatever, and then they never teach, they never show their brain, so to speak, how to use that new ankle range of motion in the squat, yeah. which is why they wanted it for in the first <laughs> place. It's not like your brain think, you know, it's not like you're going to increase the range of motion of your ankle and then suddenly it's going to magically yes. work in your squat perfectly. Yeah. You're going to default to your uh, motor pattern that you've been using, which probably doesn't involve ankle dorsiflexion. So if you're going to improve your ankle dorsiflexion, you need to ingrain it in the pattern yep. of actual squatting. Yeah. Yeah. And guys, I've made a video on that. Basically what Ryan's saying is after you mobilize, you need to activate, you need to use that new road range of motion that the mobilization afforded you and get the neuromuscular activation in that range of motion in order for it to kind of translate over to other exercises. Right, Ryan? Well, and I'll, and I'll take that even a step further. You Maybe you decrease the tone in one area, activate in another area, but then you have to put it in the functional activity. Yeah as the like the third step yeah so if somebody was had stiff ankles they weren't able to dorsiflex mobilize the ankles maybe do some resisted dorsiflexion and then do like squats yes now you're yes exactly and yeah. that's that and the, yeah exactly yeah for sure um all right so i want to wrap this up in in about you know five or ten minutes here man but one mm -hmm. of the last things that i wanted to talk to you about which is something that you brought up a second ago when you said you're not a spine popper or something <laughs> like that is uh kind of i just you're unique for you know okay. a chiropractor you definitely are especially relative to uh a lot of the local ones around me and i'm sure a lot of people agree with this a lot of chiropractors want to see people on you know weekly basis sometimes like twice or three times a week i've had people come to see me that have been seeing a chiropractor for adjustments on a you know, three times a week basis for like years. And these people are like riddled with pain and instability. Um, and I just want you to kind of share with everybody why you don't do that. Um, yeah, wh why don't you just say why you don't do that to people and how you well, first, use uh, manipulations? Sure. First, let me say this. Um, I appreciate you thinking I'm unique. <laughs> but there's, I think that there's a huge body of um, up and coming chiropractors who think along the same lines that I do, <clears throat> voice cracked, uh, <laughs> along the same lines that I think. Um, and so yeah, I think I may be somewhat unique among the field, but uh, there is a group of peers that I am not unique against, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. Uh, no. Anyway, so. Um, but there but yes, are a I, lot of people that are in well, I think that the majority. Just, I think the yeah. majority are not like the people that I'm talking about. For and sure. I hope to in include myself in that group. Um, okay, so yeah. I think that, and I'll probably make some chiropractors mad, but honestly, like, I think of my chiropractic degree as the license to treat somebody. Like, that's what I think of it as, you know, mm -hmm. and um, to treat somebody's pain and to diagnose and, and do all that stuff. Um, anyway, so when someone comes to me, I cannot make the assumption that they must be manipulated. And, and manipulation means chiropractic adjustment, basically. So some, some people will be kind of upset with that statement that manipulation and adjustment are the same thing, but it's basically taking a joint to its end range and then thrusting. Anyway, so just because someone comes into my office does not automatically, now that, oh, now I'm in a chiropractor's office, my spine must need to be manipulated in order to be better. Mm -hmm. I don't think of it like that. That would be like going to your medical doctor and no matter what the problem is, they give you the same prescription drug. Yeah. That doesn't make sense. Here's For some example, antibiotics. Antibiotics. Right, right. That's what I say. Yeah. I'm Unfortunately, that, that does happen, though. <laughs> well, right? maybe it does, and that's a problem, too. But, yeah, for okay, sure. so example this, this gal comes into my office today, and she has chronic neck and back pain, and um, her neck is so loose. Her yeah. neck joints are so loose. And when she rotates, her neck hurts. But when she puts her neck in more of a neutral kind of alignment rather than head so far forward, now rotation doesn't hurt. Yes. It's how she's using her neck. It's not 
her neck needs to be manipulated. Somebody else, maybe they do need a manipulation. Manipulation has been shown to decrease pain. It's sort of like what some of my, uh, who I would call uh, mentors, have described it as um, manual aspirin. It's a temporary pain reliever mm -hmm. created yeah, by, you know, manually by your hands. But if someone is so, if someone's joints move enough, why do I want to make them move more? And, and, you know, and the way I think about a manipulation is, okay, you can stretch the joint. You may be able to do, reduce muscle tone because there's certain muscles in the uh, spine that have a high density of kind of positional sensors. And maybe by stretching that, you can like reset that a little bit. But you're certainly not putting joints in and out of place. Yeah. Um, you are maybe reducing pain, maybe resetting a muscle spindle type thing. Um, and uh, maybe you're getting some sort of stretch reflex type of issue. But just because someone walks in, I don't know what I'm going to do with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, know, you I look at know. them like more holistically. You examine their movement, their you know neuromuscular right, right, system, right. <laughs> all of these things. Right. Okay. So if someone was in a car accident and they got whiplash, I'm not going to adjust their neck. Yeah. Their neck was just whipped around really fast. Mm -hmm. Their tissues need to recover. There may be a time when their neck needs to be be manipulated down the road when things have become less sensitive and healed. Mm -hmm. So it's coming but, back but, to what we talked about earlier. The tissue. Right. Exactly. Right. It's just you don't want to like fix on. some sort of traumatic tissue like jolt by jolting How in could, the opposite direction right okay <laughs> if someone has a cut again yeah. like we talked about oh i have a cut which basically maybe that's like whiplash i'm gonna stretch the skin around the cut yeah that doesn't make any sense <laughs> i'm you just know? gonna pull this cut apart right that makes yeah. no sense you you know you maybe you stitch it maybe you put a band-aid on it whatever i don't do wound care mm -hmm. you know what i mean but uh, yeah. if, if i went if i had a cut on my arm and they're like okay we're gonna like jiggle around the cut really hard to try to make it yeah. I'd be like, what do you do? I'm going somewhere else. So, you know? <laughs> well, what are the drawbacks of seeing a uh, chiropractor that doesn't work with patients the same way you do? What are the drawbacks of seeing a chiropractor that just wants to crack your lumbar spine every time you come in there? You have firsthand experience. See, now you're this, asking me. Right? I do because I had, a seri I had a very, very painful back after chiropractic school because my back was manipulated 100 million times. And, yes. you, know, it, you know, you can, you can make it unstable. If mm -hmm. you twist it a million times, you know, like it's not, that's abnormal joint loading to have your back manipulated so much. I mean, I could drink too much water and die. Does that mean water is bad for me? No, it just means too much water is bad for me. Yes. Um, but if someone has hypermobile joints, I mean, their, their proprioception is probably way off. They, they don't know where their end ranges are. They don't know how to control or create stiffness. And I mean, you just have to reevaluate, like what's going, what does this person need? Yeah. If they move so much, why would I want to move them around to their end ranges? I need to teach them how to transfer power from their legs to their arms without their back getting wrenched. Yeah, they need to focus more on stability and strength. Rather but I'm not going to say like, I, you know, I don't want to say like, oh, if you go to a chiropractor who doesn't do what Ryan does, that they're all terrible. You know, I'm not going to say that. But I think that if something is going to help you, it should help you. And um, it's unfortunate, I think, that people um, on both sides of that equation will treat so much with no results for many years doing the same thing and, you know, potentially create instability in a joint. I mean, instability is a real thing. Yeah. So sure. I think that you have to, you can't just think about having to just manipulate a joint. I mean, how could, how could, how is it possible? See, now I'm on my soapbox a little <laughs> bit. Okay. How would it be possible that, and I'm not saying I don't adjust people. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. I think there's a time and a place, of course. There's like, there's a time and a place for everything. But you told if, me that if you, someone's super stiff, if someone is super stiff, I'm not going to yeah. teach them how to like create more stiffness. They probably need uh -huh. to move something more, right? Yeah. Of course. And then yeah, yeah. that is when you go down that path. Okay. What did I tell you? You said that you normally use, you know, um, mobilizations and uh, manipulations on the T-spine because people are typically stiff there and you're actually trying to mobilize those areas, right? Yeah, I mean, so there's, there's of course, certain areas I mobilize more or manipulate more than others. Like, you know, the point, the thing that hurts is typically the thing under the most stress, right? Mm -hmm. Or it's the thing that's moving the most, typically. Yeah. Um, and so I usually don't manipulate the site of pain. Yes, I, because that's probably the thing moving too much. Yeah, like yeah. if if your wrist is hurt and you put it in a cast, it doesn't hurt if you immobilize it. It hurts when you you know move it around. Mm -hmm. Now that maybe there you know, and there may be a time and a place when you have to mobilize a painful joint to get it to move better. I'm not saying I'm not saying I don't ever do that. Yes, I'm just saying that you know you're 
typic- typical. Um, anyways, yeah, so I typically mobilize or manipulate the thoracic spine because it doesn't typically move enough and people make up for it in their neck or their low back. Mm-hmm. A lot of, you know, like overhead lifting, for example. For people sure. at, the, at the very top of overhead lifting, they lean back super far and they, they, they basically prevent falling backwards by loading the joints in the lumbar spine rather than moving through their shoulder and upper back. But mm-hmm. um, anyways, I mean, you just have to, you, you can't just assume, ev- like, okay, so what I was saying when I was on my soapbox, <laughs> every human pain condition is not caused by a lack of a joint being manipulated. Yes. There's other reasons why people hurt. Maybe they just move their, their body in terrible ways or, or they keep it under stress and they never like let it relax or they, you know, all these things. Does that mean adjusting is not good? No. Does that mean ch- chiropractors don't know what they're doing? No, that's not what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying that that's what I think. And I use many, many, many treatment techniques. Yes. You know, but honestly, I think teaching, like I said, like I said at the beginning, I, I think of my job as teaching someone how to use their body. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and if from, I need to manipulate their back so they yeah. can understand how to use their body, then I'll do it. Mm-hmm. From, but it's not just like you pay me, so I, I must crack you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wouldn't even. This is just my professional opinion. I wouldn't work with a chiropractor that didn't work with uh, his patients the way you do. You know, because if you're that one dimensional. I don't know. It's like you just said. It's like it's a multifactorial issue. It's it, it, it can be very, very complicated, and just f- cracking people is not always the way to fix that. And there are serious. But so, and sometimes it is. And sometimes it is. And we have to say that. Mm, yes. Sometimes it's a, like miracle. Mm-hmm. Like oh my gosh, I got adjusted once or twice or thrice. Yeah. And now it's amazing. Like there's certainly times I see that and it blows my mind. But in the uh, case of my client that had been seeing, if they've done a hundred times, how many yeah. times do you have to have a joint manipulated in order for you to not have pain? And that's the problem. Yes. And people need to understand what happens to the joint when they're being manipulated. It, you're, it's, stre- you're stretching it. You're taking it its end range. And it's becoming more mobile, and it can move around more. And not immediately. It'll take. It would take many, many cycles yeah. typically. But so like it's coming not, back to my that's client that's, right. that <laughs> had been seeing a chiropractor getting adjusted in the lumbar spine on a weekly basis, three times a week for, I think she said a year. You know, uh, Yeah, I don't like that. She had like some that. serious hypermobility in her lumbar spine that is taking a lot of uh, stabilization work to try to, to try to fix. Right, um, and that may take a long time to, to stiffen up. Yeah. So, um, and, know. and, you know, and, and, and again, I don't want to come off sounding like I'm bad-mouthing anybody. No, I am. I think that chiropractors are very uniquely skilled in our knowledge and our abilities, and I just uh, I think that it's important to focus on all aspects of how somebody moves, not just pin, pigeonhole ourselves into only one way of doing something. Yeah, no, I agree, man. I agree. And, I, and so I, I just you, the, know, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. No, I think health overall should be approached that way. You know, you can't just address your nutrition and expect to be super healthy. Right. Okay. Yeah. So say someone goes to a nutritionist and they're like, yeah. you only should eat steak and nothing else. <laughs> Does that mean steak shouldn't be part of a healthy diet? Yeah. No, it just means you can't have someone only eat one food. Yeah. I mean, if you have to do it in the right balances of things. So people yeah. need the right balance of mobility. They need the right balance of strength. They need the right balance of flexibility. Exactly. And if, and if someone, if someone came to you and they're like, super flexible which so say that means like all they eat is eggs uh-huh. okay yeah and they go to like a nutritionist and they're like oh, you just got, you got to eat more eggs I'm like i'm already eating a bunch of eggs yeah that would be like being super flexible and having no like strength mm-hmm. and have and being you know just stretched out more it makes yeah. no sense you see i see that a lot man you're you're a crossfit guy I, well, I see it a lot too. I see it a lot too. And I get a lot of patients who come to me who tell me they've been having their back adjusted three times a week for many years. Yeah. And you know who I pain. see it in the most? Yogis. Yogis. Well, they're very flexible. Yeah. A lot yeah. of them are have major mobility issues. <laughs> they're not a lot of stability and strength. You know, they're, I, they're. I would say that if you took a very flexible yo- yogi or yogini, by the way, females are yogi. Yeah, females are yoginis. Did you Wait, know that? No. I thought yeah, yogi I got, was like a. No, yogis, are, yogis are males and yoginis are females. I believe because I got in trouble once. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know that. That's amazing. So I think I mean, bombs maybe, all over the place. maybe I'm wrong and now I'm going to look like an idiot. And the person was like, ah, oh, I punked that guy. I thought that was like a made up word, but whatever. Go on. <laughs> I don't know. Anyways, not important. 
no. to me. Anyway, it's not important to me. Um, if someone's a super flexible yoga, yoga person, like, I mean, you just have to think of the spectrum of how people use their bodies. Like, if you have so much of one thing and you lack strength. Exactly. You, you know. Yeah, so that's the takeaway here, people. You need more than one modality to be physically healthy. You can't just, you know, crack your spine always back into health. You can't just lift weights without mobility and flexibility training. You need to kind of do everything, right? Well, and so here's another good example real quick if I can. Yeah, go ahead. Say someone has, say someone has back pain and they lift. And the problem is they round their back a lot in the deadlift, okay, under load. Mm-hmm. You can't just like roll out the muscles and think that your form is going to change. You can't just crack your back and think your form is going to change. You have to learn how to use your body. And so the solution for that person is probably like don't round your back in a deadlift. Yes. <laughs> and maybe to make them feel better, they can get their back manipulated a couple times or get the soft tissue treated to make it not sensitive. Maybe that can be helpful or to reset the reflex loops and those types of things. Um, but they need to learn how to deadlift. They need to learn how to pick things up. They need to learn how to create tension and use their hips and create a good um, controlled low back, you know, those types of things. Mm-hmm. And so it's all, it all has to fit into that bigger picture, you know. And you have yeah. to have a reason why you're doing something. For sure. All right, Ryan, I want to wrap this up, man. Okay. I think we're – I don't even know how long. It looks like we're around 45, 50 minutes. But, uh, That's perfect. Yeah, man. Thanks for uh, coming on. I really appreciate it. Where can people get a hold of you or check out your stuff one last time? Yeah, sure. So um, my website is themovementfix.com. Um, I do have I do post a new video every Monday for Movement Fix Monday. Make sure to uh, you can get a hold of my newsletter as well as my thirty page thirty day movement challenge guide at themovementfix.com slash thirty three zero. Um, and uh, I'm also on Instagram at themovementfix and YouTube.com slash themovementfix. Twitter at the movement fix all the same handle so you guys can get a hold of me there as well um, and I teach workshops and those can be found at the movementfix.com slash workshops is my upcoming schedule there you have it people if you're watching this on YouTube I'll include those links in the description if you're on iTunes or any other platform just have to re-listen to what Ryan just said but thanks again for coming on Ryan and uh, we'll have to do this again absolutely always a pleasure thanks for having me for sure man